Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And on behalf of the state's team, attorneys Crawford and Sitzberger and myself, as well as detectives Happy and Plenis and Mr. Vulcanier, thank you so much for paying such close attention during this trial. I have to say that it was, it stuck out in my head when I would look over at how carefully you were all listening and we really do appreciate that. This is my opportunity to argue the case. The evidence is in and soon you'll be asked to deliberate whether we've met our burden in this case on all three counts. All three counts follow this theme of murder, greed, and lies that my co-counsel introduced during opening statements. And that's how we'll discuss it here this morning, starting with count one, the first degree intentional homicide of Lynn Hernan, and moving into the greed. Count two being the theft while Ms. Hernan was alive, and count three being the theft from Ms. Hernan's estate. When we talk about count one, the judge just read you the elements. Ladies and gentlemen, we submit to you that in this case, Ms. Kershevsky caused Lynn Hernan's death with the intent to kill her. You heard moments ago that it's not necessary that every fact be proven directly by a witness or an exhibit and that in fact circumstantial evidence can be just as powerful. Whether it's direct or circumstantial evidence, the only thing that matters is whether it satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt. The circumstances in this case are significant. The cause of death in this matter, as determined by Dr. Bedritsky, is poisoning. Tetrahydrazoline is a poison. Dr. Bedritsky talked to you about her job. It is her job for Waukesha County to make determinations on cause and manner of death. She told you that it took her almost a year to do that in this case. She was the only expert who actually saw Ms. Hernan. She performed the autopsy. She testified that she viewed Ms. Hernan's tissues microscopically. She sent numerous toxicological samples to NMS labs. She reviewed thousands of pages of medical records. She conducted research and consulted with other experts and considered the facts at the death scene. And ultimately, she told you without hesitation that the poisoning that occurred in this case was at the hand of another. That's what homicide means. Death at the hand of another. Dr. Bedritsky was not here to tell you who did that. She was not concerned with that at all when making these determinations. That's not her job. But she did testify that she considers this case to be unique in a couple different ways. Definitely the toxicology was atypical. That scene was atypical. And she told you it was atypical both because of things that were there and things that weren't there. Like tetrahydrazoline bottles. Dr. Bedritsky told you that it was significant to her that of all the medication pills and bottles and powders at the scene, that Ms. Hernan's toxicology did not indicate elevated levels of those prescriptions. Certainly not fatal levels. There was only one poison in Ms. Hernan's toxicology and it was eye drops and they weren't on the scene. I submit to you ladies and gentlemen that the misleading scene that caused investigators from day one to believe this was a pill overdose was very intentional. It was intentional by the only person who was there, 
other than Ms. Kurt, Ms. Hernan. It was an intentional way to mislead. This theme of Ms. Kershevsky's intent being to mislead will carry us through the rest of the discussion this morning. And the motive? To get out of trouble, right? Because what was presented by Ms. Kershevsky to the first responders at the scene was not at all what the actual cause of death was. Ms. Kershevsky talked about how ill Ms. Hernan had been, how she liked to use her pills. There's no suicide note. Dr. Bedritsky talked to you. Ms. Hernan was not on the verge of death. This chart looks at the substances we've talked about so many times in this case. Again, only one of them is a poison. And I submit to you that the fact that the poison is in the toxicology is circumstantial evidence of the person's intent who gave it to her. The other substances underneath the tetrahydrazoline are not anywhere near fatal levels. Dr. Bedritsky told you that even together, those other substances would not have caused the death because it was the tetrahydrazoline that was so significant that that level was fatal. You were asked to make a lot of assumptions about perhaps Ms. Hernan's character, I guess, in the fact that the baclofen and cyclobenzaprine were even there, right? Because she had been told to stop taking those. They shouldn't have been there. They shouldn't have been there, you kept being told. They shouldn't have been there. The tetrahydrazoline shouldn't have been there at all because if she was using it as eye drops, it would have been under one. The level would have been under 0. Point, under 1.0. The reason Ms. Hernan wasn't taking baclofen and cyclobenzaprine is because she herself reported having side effects she didn't like. And they were not life-threatening side effects. They were rashes. They were salt in her mouth. They were weight gain. When you think about all of the counts in this case, you're going to have to think about who Ms. Hernan was. And I want you to think about the different sources of information that you've received during this trial about Ms. Hernan. And consider the sources of that information. You heard in this case from three of Ms. Hernan's closest friends, people that she loved. Anthony Poza told you he would go over there and she'd make him lunch during college and they'd talk about movies, black and white movies. They'd talk about her dad, who was in the military. Kareem Poza showed you birthday cards that she still had from Ms. Hernan. She was a very thoughtful person. She liked to cook. You heard that she would bring food to parties. Kareen Poza told you that they had an affinity for shoes together, and she laughed a little when she looked at that note on one of the birthday cards. Kareen Poza told you that she had gone thrift shopping and rummaging with Ms. Hernan because she loved to get a deal. Ms. Hernan was making plans with these people. Jim Kelleher told you they were making plans because he still had a birthday gift for her after she got out of the hospital. Anthony Poza and Keith Lang saw Ms. Hernan after they had had lunch and she made plans to see Anthony soon. Ms. Hernan was always thoughtful about her appearance and that's significant. She gave gifts that were meaningful, not necessarily expensive. She was overall, as we've seen in the patterns presented, frugal. She had a very high credit score. She paid cards down. She didn't spend a ton of money. She certainly was not someone who used technology very well. In fact, Ms. Poza told you that when she'd have photos of Anthony, Ms. Hernan would want her to physically send those to get printed so she could pick them up. She could not even manipulate the photo application on a smartphone. 
let alone some of the other things that she's been alleged to have been involved with in this case. She loved her pet, her pets, and you heard even from the insurance agent, she was a thoughtful person making Christmas gifts of food, low cost items. That is in great juxtaposition with how Ms. Hernan's been portrayed in this trial. You heard over and over that she was angry. She was so angry, she was giving up. She wanted to get rid of all of her money for some unknown reason. She wanted to have no more liquidity at the time of her death. She was suicidal. How many times did you hear these things about Ms. Hernan? And the suggestion that she was apparently scamming the government because she got food share. Hiding assets from the government to accept government assistance. I want you to think about the sources of this, these kind of attributes for Ms. Hernan. Because ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have to make credibility determinations in this case. And you have to consider what intent the source of information had. Was it to mislead you? Was it to shift your focus? What's the motive behind those kind of statements? You need to consider that when you're deciding about intent. Because at the core of this case really is the defendant's intent and the lack of consent for those theft counts. And those are all questions that Ms. Hernan can't answer because she was murdered. That's why these questions have to be answered with circumstantial evidence. And that includes motive, which is different from intent. But it's someone's reason for doing something. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that in this case, Ms. Kraszewski's intent is clear. It was to kill. The intent behind her lies is to mislead. And the motive is her own personal benefit. Whether it be getting out of trouble or money. Count two is the theft while Ms. Hernan was alive. Again, these two things Ms. Hernan can't tell you about, so we rely on the circumstances. One significant one is the difference in the patterns that you saw between Ms. Hernan and Ms. Kraszewski in this case. There was testimony about this and information gleaned from all of the financial records about these. Ms. Hernan was paying cards down. She had a great credit score. She wasn't using a ton of ATMs. She wasn't <clears throat> lavishly spending, right? You heard that she bought herself a vehicle and some jewelry. But really, other than that, she's, she's not going on vacations. She's not buying computers and iPads and things, televisions. And she's spending her money in Waukesha County in person, not online. You saw the patterns of Ms. Kraszewski in this case. The credit cards are close to their max. There's a lot of ATM and cash, cash advances. The, the spending is happening at places where Ms. Kraszewski can get cash out and gamble. Whether it be a casino or a bar, there's been testimony in this case that Ms. Kraszewski spent significant sums of money on slot machines in the geographic area where she lived and additionally using a lot of online activity. You were shown this credit score comparison and you'll see that when Ms. Hernan's score plummets is the same time that all those credit card accounts are maxing out, becoming due. No payments are being made on loans. Her score plummets in the last three or four months before her death. 
And ladies and gentlemen, the financial aspect of this case and the investigation even was very complex. It took a lot of time. There were a lot of records. There were a lot of things that needed to be put out in a, in a timeline or, or pattern so that we could understand it. It was not a simple review. I submit to you that that was exactly Ms. Krzyzewski's intent. The intent to mislead and the motive for financial gain. We focused on these accounts, the top three belonging to Ms. Hernan and the bottom two belonging to the defendant. And we talked about the theft coming out of Lynn's accounts and going into the defendant's accounts. That money market account was the big account that there was 250 grand in, right? That was an account that Ms. Hernan didn't pay bills from. She didn't write a check to, you know, We Energies from the money market account. And Detective Plentis told you why that was, because there's penalties on an account like that for too many transactions. So what you saw happening as a pattern was that Ms. Hernan would move money from the money market account into her own checking account where she'd pay bills. The only checks written from this account aside from one go to the defendant. No one else is getting thousands of dollars from this account. There's memo lines shown along the right side. I submit to you that the intent behind those memo lines is to mislead. Because that's not what this, these funds were used for. We painstakingly went through Ms. Kershewski's spending habits. There was no IRS payment. She got a tax return that year. There were no doctor bills for procedures, endoscopy procedures. There was not huge sums of money going to car payments. There were thousands and thousands of dollars a month spent at Stalis Palace. That's what you saw on the defendant's finances. A bank account that held $250,000 less than two years later had $87 and change in it. And $134,000 plus of that money went to the defendant in the form of 20 <coughs> checks. The last two entries on here were electronic checks, both written October 1st of 2018, two days before Ms. Hernan dies. And I say written, but they really weren't written, were they? Because they're electronic. This is internet check. What's the top one for? $5,000 to the defendant. And the bottom one is a check that went directly to the defendant's mom's apartment complex. These funds came out of the BMO money market account. These checks were made online. On the same day these checks were written, the defendant, who never had a BMO account of her own, downloads the BMO Harris mobile banking app. Lynn Hernan was not creating electronic checks two days before she died on the internet. <coughs> the other main account of Ms. Hernan's was her checking account, the 5336 account. And during the trial, we focused a lot on the checks written from the money market account and this checking account. But there were also expenditures that we didn't include uh, in the total, including over four grand spent on her check card while she was in the hospital. $4,000. She was only in the hospital from September 15th through the 28th. Whose spending pattern does four grand in two weeks sound like? There was over three grand of transactions after Ms. Hernan's death. 
We know that she wasn't using her check card. And ultimately, of all the checks that Ms. Hernan wrote from her checking account, included paying bills and over $10,000 in checks to the defendant. It's very telling when you look at two of those checks from Ms. Hernan's checking account. Ms. Hernan certainly knew how to give a gift if she wanted to. When Anthony graduated high school, Ms. Hernan's intent was to give him $200. So she wrote a check and in the memo line, it says graduation. <clears throat> There's one other check in the form of a gift from this checking account. It's to Ms. Kershewski. The memo line says gift. Look at the value of that check. $2,612.17 for a gift. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Kraszewski is the only person in Ms. Hernan's life getting gifts like that. There is absolutely nothing in this record for you to conclude that people like Anthony stopped caring about Ms. Hernan or that she stopped caring about him. Absolutely nothing. This makes no sense because the date of the 2,600 bucks that Ms. Kershewski got was July 22nd of 16. She didn't graduate from high school that day. She didn't get married. She didn't have a baby. I'm object to information that's not in the record, Judge. Um, overall. That check is not to celebrate a monumental part of Ms. Kershewski's life, like the $200 that Anthony got when he graduated. When you add up these checks, you get that total that we talked about before. And ladies and gentlemen, that was Ms. Kershewski's primary source of income, right? You saw her paychecks over the span of almost two years total less than 50 grand. Her income was stealing from Ms. Hernan, and she never paid a dime of it back. <coughs> this total of over $144,000 does not take into account several other pieces that are very suspicious in this case and give another piece of circumstantial evidence for you when you consider, is this really what Lynn wanted? In February of 2018, a loan is applied for. For 30 grand is what ultimately gets approved. At that point in time, Ms. Hernan is not in some sort of dire financial situation. She's not trying to buy a home. There's absolutely no reason gleaned from Ms. Hernan's financial accounts that she would need this kind of a loan in February of 2018. I submit to you that the way that this loan was applied for that's not something that Ms. Hernan was capable of doing, frankly. Because these documents on the left, this kitten check, I've highlighted the last four of the account number on the bottom of that check. That was given to Goldman Sachs to say, here's the account we want this money to go in, right? It has Lynn Hernan's name on it, but that's the defendant's account. The 8149 account did not have Lynn Hernan on it when this application was made. And what that means to you, ladies and gentlemen, is that that is fraud. It's not real. That check is not real. What else isn't real that Goldman Sachs received? We went through painstaking detail about the different 
uh, financial banking support documents that that um, loan provider received. Again, they're fraud. They are fraudulent. Someone who knows how to create documents and manipulate information turned the bank account information of herself to look like it was Ms. Hernan's. The information that Marcus Goldman Sachs was given during this application process includes that phone number that we've talked about, 262-421-5290. Detectives told you that is not a number that Lynn Hernan used. We know one person that used that number, and it was the defendant who gave it over the phone to a bank when she was pretending to be Lynn Hernan. The intent behind this is to mislead. The motive is financial gain. Ms. Kershewski has to then add Lynn Hernan to this account before the money is dispersed because the loan is in Lynn Hernan's name. So the money gets put in to Jesse Kershewski's account on March 8th of 2018, $30,000. And this was all done online. Ladies and gentlemen, Lynn Hernan knew how to give gifts if she wanted to give gifts. There are such more simple ways of transferring money to someone than this. And that circumstance goes directly to consent. That loan ultimately has some payments made from the estate account, right? Goldman Sachs is saying there's minimum payments due on this loan. The defendant pays three times out of the Tri-City account, all the while having never listed that $30,000 loan on the final accounting. <coughs> Ms. Kershewski never discloses it. She never pays it. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that's because her intent was to mislead and her motive was for financial gain. We know Ms. Kershewski is accessing these accounts without Ms. Hernan because this call placed near Ms. Kershewski's mom's house is a call to the bank. If we could play that, please. Thank you for calling uh, City. My name is Melanie. Can I have your name as it appears on your card? Lynn A. Hernan. This is another circumstance for you to consider when you're trying to determine whether all of this financial activity was done with Ms. Hernan's consent. If she's with Ms. Hernan and Ms. Hernan wants her to have all this money, why do you have to pretend to be her on the phone? There's evidence in this record that Ms. Hernan knew how to make a call to make a transfer of funds to talk to her bank on the phone. There's absolutely no logical reason why Ms. Kruszewski would have to call any of these banks and pretend to be Ms. Hernan. The intent was to mislead and the motive was for financial gain. And that's why all of Ms. Kershewski's information is on the victim's credit report, which the defense showed you, Exhibit 621. Ms. Kershewski's P.O. box, her phone number, and the 5290 number are all on here. Another circumstance for you to consider in terms of whether this was all with consent Ms. Kershewski gave a pretty detailed account of what she and Ms. Hernan did on October 3rd of 2018, multiple times in those interviews. And when you look at these, it's actually quite morbid. Ms. Hernan is either being poisoned, dying, or dead, 
and Jennifer Flower gets a new 75 inch TV and an Apple Watch on Ms. Hernan's dime. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that Lynn Hernan did not have the desire to have a JCPenney credit card opened up the day she died. Most or all of these things happening online, which Ms. Hernan also didn't do. At this point in time, the money market is depleted, the checking account is depleted, and the credit cards are maxed out. But there's still money for Ms. Kershawski after Ms. Hernan is dead. Because when Ms. Hernan dies, Ms. Kershevsky then files for the informal administration in the probate estate. Her and Anthony Poza are the beneficiaries and immediately, Anthony told you that it was odd how quickly Ms. Kershevsky told him, you have to sign off on, on this stuff so we can get the estate going. And after that point in time, ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that the Tri-City Estate Account became Ms. Kershevsky's source of income. Over $50,000 in cash went from that account into Ms. Kershevsky's pocket. It was not going to creditors. And when Anthony realized how, just how much money had already come out of that estate and asked some questions about it, We have a series of fraud handed from Ms. Kershevsky to Anthony Poza. The intent to mislead. The motive, financial gain. 52 pieces of paper Anthony Poza got from Jesse Kershevsky. Here's 17 of them. Fake. They're fake. The vet clinic administrator came in here and told you that's not correct. And not only was this created so that Ms. Kershevsky could pocket an extra $100, but the cats put down and their name got deleted from, for no reason. Fake. Fake, fake, fake. Serve pro bill, fake. <clears throat> Detective Plinus painstakingly went through these documents and showed you that they're all fraud created by someone who is very good at making fraudulent documents look correct. Mr. Poza thought, well, okay. And this is, you saw this through the handwriting expert. There's the Jeep title. Fake. Debt's a decedent. Fake. These numbers don't even match the numbers that she tried to give Anthony Poza. And the will. Fake. Ms. Kershevsky knew that she had to create some reason why she had taken 50 grand out of the estate account, why she had spent another 15 plus in payments out toward other accounts. You heard testimony that there's one person involved in this case who has previously used fraud, used a mechanism to mislead for financial gain. Two different times back in 2010. You can consider those for Ms. Kershevsky's intent and motive in this case. And I submit to you that it's very clear. Her intent is to mislead and her motive is for financial gain. Ms. Kershevsky has a pattern of making things up to get herself out of trouble. Attorney Taylor testified that when she got involved, Ms. Kershevsky got removed as the personal representative. 
Ms. Kruszewski's backed into a corner at that point, right? She's not in charge of this anymore. So what does she do? What does she do to try to get herself out of hot water? She files with the circuit court this new will that removes Anthony with some, Attorney Taylor told you, very odd explanation that the first will was some sort of a test that then Anthony failed. She's never heard of that in her life because it's ridiculous. And the loan, the loan alone of $18,700 meets your value criteria on count three. Not even considering the cash or payments that were made from the Tri-City account to the defendant's own debts. None of that inheritance loan funding is valid. That is theft. Ladies and gentlemen, you were told that personal rep representatives have a fiduciary duty to act in the best interests of the estate, not themselves. Not themselves. The estate was the rightful owner of the money at the time of this theft. And as one of the beneficiaries, Anthony Poza is listed as a victim on the count three. None of that $87,000 went back into this estate account. There is an intent to permanently deprive. Ms. Kruszewski didn't pay any of it back. And ultimately, Mr. Poza receives a check for 13 grand, which was half of what's left after Ms. Kruszewski stole from it. Again, you can't read someone's mind to determine intent. But the case comes down to intent, all three charges, right? Because Ms. Kruszewski says, I didn't steal from Ms. Hernan and I didn't kill her. But this is again where you're gonna have to make some credibility determinations in the face of so much circumstantial evidence. Because ladies and gentlemen, lies are very tricky to keep track of. <coughs> the truth is very simple. And in this case, we've shown that Ms. Kruszewski lies when it will benefit her. When she's in hot water, she lies. Ms. Kruszewski compartmentalizes people in her life to keep them all from the truth of what's actually happening. And the intent behind this is to mislead them. And the motive is her own personal gain. Throughout this case, the question of whether Ms. Hernan was suicidal changes multiple times. On day one, on October 3rd of 2018, Ms. Kruszewski is not telling any EMS worker or deputy, oh my gosh, she's been drinking by Zine. She had a gun once. She's been trying to kill herself. I can't believe this happened. No, she's asked, point blank, was Ms. Hearn suicidal? And the answer is yes and no. But after <coughs> this date, what do we know about Ms. Kruszewski? She's very interested in what the medical examiner knows and what the sheriff's department knows because she's calling. What's in the toxicology? Do we have the toxicology back yet? Until they finally tell her, we can't talk to you anymore. So she comes in and talks to detectives. This entire discussion on Ms. Kershevsky's point is to mislead them. She's not going to reveal she poisoned Ms. Hernan with tetrahydrazoline because she doesn't know they found it yet. She doesn't know that anybody knows what she did yet. So she's not gonna bring it up, just like she didn't bring it up on the day it happened. Maybe they won't find it. Then we have the star, July 9th of 2019. When Ms. Kershevsky is finally told this. I'll be honest, there's been three times that she said, I want to give up. Yeah. I don't want to do this anymore. And she always said, the day when it comes, I want your help. The day when it comes, I want your help. I said, I'm not helping you do anything. When it comes to pills or messing around with anything, that's, I'm not looking for trouble. I'm not trying to get in trouble. 
Like she she's said, a like full-grown a, adult. Like her doctor from work. So that's a pretty different story than that. As soon as she knows the gig's up, well, okay, three times she said she wanted to give up. Ms. Kershevsky is constantly considering the new information that she's getting and altering her story in a way that benefits her. The next day, she wants to talk to law enforcement. I want you to remember that. All of these interviews are because Ms. Kershevsky thought about things overnight and wanted to give more information the next day. So the next day, the question, <clears throat> the question of was Lynn suicidal changes again. Because she was trying to find an easy way out. She was trying to kill She did kill the herself. pills first numerous times that wasn't working. So she was trying to kill herself yeah. by drinking Visine and Vodka. She also bought a gun offline when that I died. disposed of for before she died too. When? How long? Oh, t two months. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that Ms. Kershevsky knew, well, they found it in the toxicology now. I have to say she was suicidal and that she drank it on her own to keep myself out of trouble. The intent behind all of this is to mislead, and the motive is to keep herself out of trouble. These focus over here, she bought these guns. Right? Misleading the investigators. There's these guns. She bought them. I, I wrestled one away from Ms. Hernan once. Okay, well, Ms. Kraszewski is really the person, based on the evidence, that acquired those items. The Brownell firearm. Here's the phone call. Hey, I want to change the delivery from a residence to a FedEx pickup. That phone call is made from Ms. Kraszewski's phone near her house, and this is all in order placed on Ms. Hernan's credit card. This one's even more telling, because what do we know about September 27th of 2018? Lynn Hernan is at Waukesha Memorial Hospital, which is nowhere near the map that you're being shown from Exhibit 173. This is a phone call to Urban Arms, another order using victim's credit card. She's in the hospital, and the order is made on Ms. Kraszewski's phone. That's all nonsense. It's all an effort to mislead. Because in reality, Ms. Kraszewski's story changes iterations based on the amount of information that she has. And the only things that never change are things that only Lynn could correct. That she was suicidal and that she wanted to give all of her money away. I'll say again, credibility is a huge task for you in this case. And when we talk about someone's credibility, um, you've seen firsthand things that Ms. Kraszewski has no problem lying about. Dan Radloff sat up there and told you that she would pretend to go to work when he was living with her. She would get up, get ready, and pretend like she had a job. Later saying, yeah, no, I, I don't actually, I'm not actually working. Up to big lies. Like a lie to a family she lived with. Why did the Craig family think Lynn Hernan was in a coma at Freighter? This is why, because Ms. Kraszewski told that to Scott Craig. And remember why this comes up. In May of 2018, what's going on in Ms. Kraszewski's life that makes this lie something that's going to personally gain? She's going to gain from. The scenario is that Scott wants nothing to do with her anymore. And it's all an attempt to mislead to shift your focus. Scott, forget about that and look over here. Lynn Hernan's in a coma. She was never in a coma at Freighter Hospital, and Ms. Kershevsky never told Scott Craig that. The detectives told Scott Craig that. The 
The motive is to get herself out of hot water. And nonetheless, she lies about telling them that. So I'd be held by her. Again, yeah, this is a guy who swears he's told me she was in a coma. No. Why I've you, never said that, swear to God. <laughs> why do you think he's so upset? This is someone that she was closest with. She lived with. Scott Craig was also someone in Ms. Kraszewski's life that had to stay very compartmentalized. It is no coincidence that he never met Lynn Hernan, ladies and gentlemen. It is no coincidence that Scott Craig was not invited to the funeral dinner for Lynn Hernan, where Scott may have been able to talk with an Anthony Poza or a Keith Lang or a Kareen Poza. So sad about Lynn being in a coma at Freighter. Can you imagine if Scott would have said that at the dinner? No way. This was something that was so significant because he had no idea. Ms. Kraszewski was very, very good at misleading Mr. Craig. And he expresses the frustration and shock in this call that you heard from State's Exhibit 54. I was told she's in the hospital. You said why are we in the hospital? hospital numerous times? Well, not in a coma for five months. That's what you told me. So, I know that's what I told you. Yeah, I told I you know. that to protect that's you for a reason. I told you that to protect you for a reason. That makes no sense, ladies and gentlemen. Another consideration in your credibility determination of the defendant in this case should be this January 2019 discussion, which happens up here on our timeline, well before the star. What is going on on this day in January of 2019? Do you recall the beginning of this discussion? Scott Craig's mad at her. She's in, she's in hot water again. Right? However, that disagreement evaporates once she says this. Tetrahydrazoline in my blood. Detective Cole couldn't even pronounce the word tetrahydrazoline. And Jesse Kraszewski is spelling it out in a text message, pretending to be at the hospital. She obviously goes on to ever deny saying this in 2019. And then changes that story to, okay, it was a friend, and then changes that story to, okay, I actually drank it, but no one was really poisoned. But the main point that you need to consider, which bears on intent, is that in Ms. Kraszewski's own statement, she knows exactly how serious tetrahydrazoline is. And she's right about that. Because you heard testimony in this case that when used for nefarious purposes, perpetrators select tetrahydrazoline because it impairs memory, impairs judgment, reduces inhibition, produces a period of unconsciousness. It's not routinely detected, and it's available. Nonetheless, six months later, when Ms. Kraszewski is told, this is her response. I get it. Um, and there's an anomaly in her toxicology. There's a drug in her system that's not supposed to be there. What would that be? Um, it's called tetrahydrazine. What is that? How commonly known as eye drops. Hmm. hmm. This is six, six months have gone by. So now she knows. What does she say about whether Ms. Hernan was using it? A lot. 
Like not enough, you can't take it through your eyes. It has to be ingested through through orally. I've never seen her drink it ever, ever. And why would you drink eye drops? I mean, what would it taste like? I don't even know. But not. Oh my gosh! I've been buying bottles of this stuff for her because she drinks it all the time, and I've seen her drink it. No, it's. Yeah, because that doesn't sound right, but I didn't give her anything. I didn't even give her her pills wrong or vodka or drug. I didn't give her anything. I didn't give her this eye drop. Then we have a period of time where Miss Kershewski is thinking. And the next morning she says, I want to talk again. Right? This is the next day. I've gotten the visine for her. I never put any in her anything for her, ever, ever, never. I bought it for her, that's as far as I've gotten. I've never even put it in her eyes for her. I submit to you that the intent behind this is to mislead and the motive is to get herself out of trouble. Or this would have been something she said on day one. And she was drinking vodka and visine. Now, how, how do you know she was drinking vodka and visine? Because that's what she had mixed together. And that was the day before. How do you know she had mixed visine with her, with her vodka? Because that's what she did. There's still some distance there, right? That was the day before. Again, there's a night that goes by. Ms. Kurczewski is thinking. And the next morning on the 11th, I want to talk again. I've got more information. <clears throat> she did she, one time, the whole time I've known her, she drank one bottle in front of me. Just one time. One bottle. And she never did that afterward. I was so upset and hurt by it because I don't, I, I didn't want her to do this. I didn't think it was the best way to go. She was trying everything. Two days ago, this person is saying, I've never seen her drink it, ever, ever. And now she's drinking a whole bottle of it in front of her. This is the same day. The water didn't taste like anything in the vodka she liked it because she got like a little more of a buzz off of it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, not one doctor or expert told you that that is factual at all. Dr. Thomas testified that she is unaware of anything that would suggest people are drinking tetrahydrazoline because of some euphoric or buzz. Dr. Bedritsky said the same thing. Even Dr. Spiller said that's not a symptom or side effect of drinking tetrahydrazoline. Again, the intent is to mislead. Knowing she wants it. Once I put in two drops for her. Okay. Once. In what? In her vodka. Okay. And how, once was how long before that? That was a uh, month and a No. Probably four weeks. Three, four weeks before. That was the only time I ever did it. Ladies and gentlemen, when you determine credibility, you have to consider whether the source of the information has an interest in the outcome. This is the last version that you're left with. Oh. That bottle of water right there had in six, six vices. How do, you, how do you know that? Because that's what she put in it. When? She told me. The three days before I threw it out. And she asked for it that morning. Did three you get it to her? gave it to her. Yeah. I ask you, ladies and gentlemen, can you even rely on that? Credibility is again questioned as we begin this wild goose chase. On July 12th, there's the first little piece of information about things that are hidden away. And before you even dive into this, I want you just to think why in the world would someone hide these types of items? Nonetheless, it starts with the BMO lockbox. Get me out. 
Okay. That's what I'd like. Okay. Check her BMS Harris. Her BMO, BMO Harris Bank. Okay. She has a black box. I thought you said this was a storage shed. That's where she put her items. No. And this is a BMO Harris black box now. Correct. I didn't give any specifics for a reason. You said a storage shed. I said it's not in my name. So in a lock box, BMO there Harris. is a, a gun. No. There is. Where is the gun? I said she has her stuff and I have my stuff. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, on July 12th, when Ms. Kershewski tells Aaron Hoppy to look in that BMO lockbox, she absolutely knows it's empty. Because she was the last one there with her mom the day after Lynn Hernan died. And in April of 2019, before these interviews, she surrenders that box, signing that there's nothing in it. Shift the focus. Look at things that don't matter. She has a new layer to this whole story then. Can tell us where you bury this stuff? No, I'll tell you. Where'd you bury it? <laughs> it's in Whitnall Park. Whitnall Park? That's where my bunny used to be buried. It's behind my mom's apartment. Again, why, instead of, so in theory there, instead of telling anyone what happened, I'm gonna keep it quiet and I'm gonna save some of this stuff in case Lynn Hernan does die. And then after she's died and, and I've lied about how she died, I'll have it buried. You, you can't even connect it in a, in a logical way if you try. I mean does get muddy and swampy certain times of the year. It wasn't when I went. Um, I did this literally before she even passed. So, and it was all together in three Ziploc bags. Or is it in a box or anything? Nope. Or it's just three, three Ziploc three bags. Ziploc I just bags. kept Ziploc bagging it and then the freezer bags. And how far down? I would say about four to five feet. Four to five feet? Yeah. Are you Are you kidding me? Maybe four? I don't know. I guess... Four feet? Hold on. <laughs> you understand you're Maybe just not. over four feet. Okay, like this. What is this? I'm not going okay, to stop. Okay, that means two feet. Okay, hold on. Four feet. Yeah, yes, you're right. That is like, you like, 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 stop. If you give me more, like, I'm like, one of those people sometimes, like, I'm better, like, I have roads. Like, I can't tell balls. you roads, but I can show you. Yeah, I guess that's true. I'm fine with that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Kraszewski is not stupid. She knows the difference between five feet and 18 inches. But Detective Hoppy wasn't buying it, so the story changes. Law enforcement attempts to find these things every time she says they exist. Metal detectors and detectives out in parks looking for rocks over, over burial sites. Her initial claim of a storage shed somewhere comes up again on the 16th. The storage shed, Justin. I know there's a storage there shed. There isn't, I swear to God, there's not a storage shed. I, I put down everything. I just said that because I thought by saying that that would help me get out. I swear to you on everything. She thought I'd help her get out of trouble. That's why she said that. Ladies and gentlemen, the reality of Jesse Krzyzewski looks a lot different than this person in Exhibit 206 crying about a lost burial site. The reality of this person, her acts, words, and statements, is that she is accessing documents about criminal poisoning in July of 2018 and deleting them in February of 2018. Sorry, 2019. Household poisons. Arsenic trioxide. 
Ladies and gentlemen, what else do we know happened right around February of 2019 in this case? <clears throat> right in here. The medical examiner wouldn't talk to her anymore. The reality of this case, ladies and gentlemen, is that this is someone with a fair amount of poison research on her own phone. This is someone who has profited over $144,000 before death and over $80,000 after. This is someone who misleads others when she's in hot water. I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that Ms. Krzyzewski thought she would get away with this or be able to talk her way out of it. But the reality of this is that the cause of death is a poisoning and the manner of death is a homicide. At the time Lynn Hernan died, she was worth more to Ms. Krzyzewski dead than alive. And this person that you heard about, this loving person on the left, did not kill herself. Based on all the facts and evidence that you've seen, the state is going to ask that you return three verdicts of guilty in this case. Thank you.